Welcome everyone. We're going to get started. There may still be a few people joining. That's okay. And we are in webinar format. So that means uh, you all are hidden as our attendees. If you want to ask a question and uh, be on screen, not a problem. Just uh, click on the raise your hand button. I will go over to you, unmute you, feel free to share. Otherwise, we have the chat box available. Please jump in. And then we have a Q&A box that we can ask questions on. If you have a question come up, like mid-presentation, please drop it in, and then we'll get to it at the end. So yeah, welcome on behalf of Will. Um, my name is Kelly. I am the Vancouver Chapter Co-Chair for Women in Leadership for Vancouver. And we have three amazing, amazing, talented expert speakers here to walk us through negotiation, uh, the conversation, of asking for more. It is really an art, like it says, there's a lot to this. And as women, we traditionally do not ask for more. Uh, there's a lot of science behind that and we're gonna get into a little bit of that as we move forward, but lots to cover here. So again, welcome on behalf of Will. So we have three speakers, like I said, we're gonna start with Teresa followed by Eden and Carrie. I will send out everyone's links to their bios at the end. If you'd like a recap of these amazing women, please look them up, follow them on LinkedIn, look at their websites. Uh, Carrie has an amazing book. There is lots to dig into, but I don't want to take the distraction away while we're having this webinar. So I'll send it at the end for everyone to look once we've finished. So kind of an agenda. We're gonna have a goal of like 15 minutes per expert. Then we're going to have some Q and A. And then we're going to do a soft close at 6.30. And then if anyone would like to stay for optional extended Q and A, if you have any more burning questions, you are welcome to hang around and we will get through those. And if anyone hasn't looked us up yet, please do um, follow our newsletter. We have a lot of free events. There is a lot of content out there for um, anyone that wants to join. And most of it is virtual, thanks to this new world we're in. So you could attend national events from all our other chapters. Okay, so again, raise your hand if you want to be part of the conversation. If anything comes up, pop it in the Q&A. Otherwise, I'm gonna hand it over to Teresa, our first amazing, talented speaker. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, it is an honor to be part of such a lovely panel, and I'm looking forward to sharing some ideas and answering some questions at the end. So I'm going to uh, get myself into presentation mode, and then, of course, oops, there we go. You have to share your screen first. Hang on one second. Okay, logistics. All right, share screen, PowerPoint. There we are. Okay, and... Presentation mode. Okay, you guys see it okay? Are we good? Can you yeah. see the presentation? We do see it, but it has the next animation on the side. It's not mm. on the next animation, interesting. Okay, all right, bear with me here. Okay, presentation mode. Is it still doing it on the side? Uh, showing presenter view, someone has commented. Okay, thanks everyone for your patience here. So I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. I think presenter mode only works if you have more than one screen, like if you have more than one monitor. Okay, so let me try it another way. Okay, share screen, and we're gonna go with this one. Share, how's that? Yay! Got it. Okay, everyone, this is what not to do when you are doing presentations. Now that we are clear on that. Okay, hang on one second. I'm just going to move this over. Okay, up here. Okay, great. 
Okay, well, welcome everyone. And as you've heard, I'm your co-panelist here, Teresa, I'm going to take about 10-15 minutes with you today, walking through a piece of the negotiation experience. And uh, um, I'm, I'm excited about questions if we have some. I, I would say with, with my presentation, I've thrown some things in there that are uh, kind of additional. So if you have um, some interest in capturing them, get your screenshot fingers ready or your, pic your camera ready, because you might want to just take a picture of a couple of the things. Um, I know they're going to send you some materials afterwards, but if you just want it um, to look at it and try because it's fresh in mind, um, I recommend having your screenshot or your camera ready for some of the material I'm going to go through today. So um, basically, in terms of my background, um, I have uh, about over 15 years uh, working as a coach and a recruiter, um, heading up HR and, and recruitment in different various companies and technology, Le working in l and I do leadership development at Netflix, coaching clients at these types of companies, and I'm currently actually doing a gig helping out Cleo with talent acquisition on the side. So I keep my finger in a few pies, keep pretty busy. Um, and um, if you're wanting to um, get a hold of me um, afterwards, um, there's some of the information there. I don't have a website. I like to just use LinkedIn for now. So now on to the meaty stuff. So, so many elements can go into negotiation. When we talked about this, we we're like, we could go this way, we could go that way. Um, you know, tons of preparation, situational context, all sorts of different things. Um, but one of the most important elements in negotiation I come back to as a recruiter all the time is you who you are, how you see things, uh, what you want to do, what you want to enjoy. This is also known as your inner game. Um, the more you know your inner game, the more you can not only negotiate for what you really want, um, but you can also increase your sense of self-confidence and esteem in the process. It elevates even more your chances of success. So as a recruiter and as a coach, because I'm fortunate I, can see, I get to see both sides, and also as a job seeker myself, um, many candidates and clients, they try to be what they think the company wants them to be, what they think, you know, the job description needs them to be. Um, doing that exclusively is not fun. I'm not saying like, don't tailor certain aspects of things, but when you're trying to like fit into a mold that you think other people want, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. Um, the candidates that know what the company wants yet can convey their unique selves, um, where possible, those are the ones that usually tend to stand out the most, and therefore they can leverage negotiation, and they usually do it with more confidence. We see this as recruiters all the time. So the better you know yourself, the better you can negotiate for what you want and actually be happy with it. So these are great premises, and everyone's like, oh, you know, you've got to know yourself. You've got to be authentic. I had a junior recruiter today who was having an epiphany. She's like, oh, the candidates that just know who they are. It's, and so I tell them, and then doesn't it drive you nuts? You're like, well, that's just great information. How do I do it, right? Well, lucky this is what I do for a living is to help people with that how. And so basically we're gonna just focus on three tools for tonight because we only have a short little bit of time. And these are some of my most favorite tools when it comes to really working on your inner game so you can amplify that negotiation. So noticing mindset and a tool that I developed with my coaching clients called Super Strengths. Um, all right, first of all, there's noticing. So noticing is interesting. I personally feel like there's a poverty of noticing that's happening in the world. People are running to the future. They're, you know, worrying on the past and then they're not really noticing what's going on around them. They're, they're, they're so busy and there's a plethora of things going on. And so what we're not noticing are the small things that make us smile, for example. So as you move through your day, I don't know how many of you have just stopped to notice, am I enjoying myself right now? Or did I just smile? Or did I actually like this? Um, instead, something nice happens, but we're on to the next thing. We've got stuff to solve. We've got things to achieve and, and, and you know, goals to hit. We're not pausing and noticing. Also, another piece that you know, kind of accentuates this tendency, neurologically, we have something called a default negativity bias. Um, it makes us look for threats and survival, usually in the future, sometimes in the present moment. And the, the thing, though, is this isn't caveman times anymore. So we have to be more deliberate, working with the frenetic pace of life now, which wasn't like it was before, and, and understand those primitive drivers that stop us from pausing and looking around and noticing. 
um, what we are doing and how it makes us feel. This is basic, but but trust me, I, I've had executives C-suite that I have to I have to say, okay, we have to sit with your coffee, pause. What are you liking right now? Because everyone's just like achieve, 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 right? So how does this factor into successful negotiation? Um, it builds your self-awareness muscles. It's a key component also, not only in negotiation, but in leadership development. So what do you really like? The little things, they add up to, to that story. Everyone thinks it's the big accolades, but noticing the little things is a big piece of it. That's why I call you. I'm going to tell you what the name is in a second here. So they also help reveal your strengths. Um, which we're going to get into. And, and that's why I encourage people to do an exercise that enhances your noticing um, with something called the breadcrumbs of joy. So you're like, why is this strange picture on the side? Now you know. I call it the breadcrumbs of joy because life sometimes feel like we're following breadcrumbs, um, but maybe if we paid attention to them, we might notice that they're actually quite wonderful, pleasurable breadcrumbs of joy. And um, so how to do breadcrumbs of joy? Well, there's one way um, you can do your breadcrumbs of joy. Oops, hang on one second. So one way is a uh, pad of paper. So while you're at your work, um, this is one of those pages you can take a picture of if you like, because there's another exercise you can do on your own time. But a pad of paper on your desk, maybe it's a nice pretty one to draw your attention as you work through your day. But just start to notice, notice using your breadcrumbs of joy, what are these little things that make me smile through the day? What are those? And when you get to the end of a week, maybe sit down with yourself, a nice glass of wine, kombucha or cappuccino, whatever it is, spend some time with your best friend, which should be yourself, and, and find out like what is the data that I'm getting in this list that I'm making. You're collecting data, being like a scientist, amalgamating it, and starting to decode even more clearly what are the places that you love and that you lean into, okay? So that's a huge piece. You can even do it over a month. And then if you want to make it more fun and more accountable and more social, you can use the, the exercise on the right, which is with a friend. You can do it in groups of two or three. I have a coaching group every Monday. We, we do something that's similar to this. Um, and it really roots you into helping know yourself. All right. So that's like building your noticing muscle, which helps you understand more about who you are, what matters to you. And what matters to you helps you decide Am I willing to negotiate this or not? Or do I even want to try? Okay. So the next one we're going to move to is mindset. Now, some of you are like, oh, yeah, 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 I know mindset. I don't know what she's going to say. And you're probably right, but it, it is so important. It bears repeating. Um, mindset can be as simple as two choices, right? So the two choices are what's wrong with the situation? You see this everywhere, all over social media. Our society is obsessed with what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, I'm on the right, you're on the left, like whatever, like wrong, 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 right on, right. I tell you, the older I get, the less sure I am about what truly is right and what truly is wrong, which is a whole other conversation we can have over a cup of tea sometime. But what's wrong with the situation also neurologically doesn't serve you in negotiation, because in negotiation, one of the most important things you're doing is you're trying to collect as much information as possible. So how do you collect a lot of information in various ways? Neurologically, you will collect less if you narrow your vision. By focusing on what's wrong, your brain actually starts to go into sort of like a, um, you might've heard this before, like if there's danger, if you're isolating threat or which something that's wrong is like a threat, okay? So if there is threat, neurologically, your brain goes into a pinhole, like a narrow perspective. Picture a tiger in the jungle. If you want to survive, you need to identify exactly what that tiger is doing, what it looks like, how big those paws are, how far away it is, and you become very focused. But at the expense of every single else around, you don't see the jungle anywhere near as close. I actually had that experience when I was learning how to drift in a car. My teenage son made me do it. And when I first started out, I was terrified. And all I could see were my thumbs on the steering wheel as I'm skidding around on the parking lot. And then as I relaxed and I took a breath and I was like, there's nothing wrong. This is actually fun. Suddenly I'm like, oh, there's an instructor beside me. Oh my gosh. And I can do, I'm doing donuts. Like it's an amazing neurological experience. So you want to open up and expand your, your brain and the way you see. There's so much data on this, it'll blow your mind. If any of you seen the gorilla thing where people are focused on the ball that's bouncing and they miss the gorilla that walks by, that's a fascinating experiment. 
Instead, let's try what can I learn from the situation. Negotiation can be a merciless, no-win situation, sometimes zero-sum situation. You never know. So instead of what's right, what's wrong, win, fail, maybe, maybe trying a learning mindset, which is also some of you have known um, Carol Dweck's work growth mindset. What can I learn from this situation? And then you expand. You're not under threat anymore. You expand your ability to see, collect information, which you're doing in very heightened situations. Sometimes you're in an interview, you're on, you know, you're in a meeting physically, or you're online. These are stressful situations. So how you calm yourself is, is with your mindset. And, and if you're struggling with right and wrong, I would even go as far as saying what's aligned for me in this situation. What's in alignment? What's in misalignment? Okay. Um, that's more like avoiding judgment and erring into curiosity. So it's healthier and you'll enjoy your negotiation a lot more and get more information from it. Okay. So then the next one is your super strengths. Whipping along here. Okay. So Marcus Buckingham, if anyone has heard of Marcus Buckingham, I was really happy the day um, I heard about him because he redefined strengths. Strengths are actually the things that energize you. They're not just the things you're good at. You know, you go to school and you're like, I'm so good at this, I'm so good at this. Everything's rewarded for what you're good at. Meanwhile, you're dying inside because you're doing something that you hate, right? So you have to be aware of the draining competency. So, so what's an example of this? So the things that energize you, okay, I'll speak from my own experience. So I was at one time heading up recruitment and part of heading up recruitment is um, workforce planning where you have heavy duty spreadsheets and things like that. So I was good at making sure it was all set up and everything was ready to go. And at the end of the day, um, if, you asked, if, if you asked me, was I lit up by making sure spreadsheets worked? I would say, no, I'd rather stick an ice pick in my eye. This is not something that I want to do. So if you understand that, you're not going to go negotiate for it in your in your roles. And I know some of this might be obvious to some of you. And if it is, then, then that's a success because the, the gobs of people I've been coaching, so many people don't even understand what they truly love. They're not paying attention to it. They're, they keep thinking about what other people want. So it's really important to pause and just like the breadcrumbs of joy. What? What do I like? Like, what do I really like? Because next thing you know, you're going to get that awesome job because I've done it. I'm in that awesome job. I'm the head honcho, woohoo, and I'm miserable. And now I negotiate it and I hate it. So what, what am I doing wasting my time negotiating for things I don't like? So I don't know if any of you relate to this. Um, you know, it, of course we want to learn the hard way sometimes to really get good lessons from it. But if there's a way to avoid it, why not? So watch out for those draining competencies and notice, notice what those are. There's a whole other big bunch of information with super strengths in terms of how you name them and articulate them in interview settings and things like that. But at the very least, you can make a dent in it by taking a picture of this if you like and start to ask yourself some of these questions or, or do it with a friend or a colleague if, if it's a trusted space. You know, one of my favorite clients, you know, they were, they were gearing up for a promotion with negotiation and they're trying to decide if they wanted the the job that they were they're being lined up for and um when we dug into their super strengths i was like what's what's your favorite like one of your happiest moments ever he's like oh when i'm on a team and i'm like doing what he's like when i'm leading from behind and i'm like well leading from behind you know it's kind of like flat and i knew he played world of warcraft because i used to work in video games i knew about this i'm like what character in world of warcraft do you kind of love to play and he's like a druid and i'm like oh your strength, you're a druid. That's your strength. And he was like, oh, and then all of a sudden he's like, I know who I am. And he's like, I don't want that job. And I'm like, that's great. And so he was super happy. So that's just a small example of how understanding your strengths can help you negotiate for the right thing, right? Um, so in, in summation, um, as a recruiter also, I'm going to say this. I don't, as a recruiter, want to figure out where you will fit best. I have, I, I want you to do that for me. I'm too busy. Like, I, like recruiters are understaffed. There, there's hard, there's too much work. There's too much to do. I don't want to figure that out for you. No, you knowing these things about yourself helps because I will pick it up in you. I will hear what you want with authenticity and with some certainty, what you want. And you'll come across as genuine, authentic. It helps your negotiation process in spades. 
I'll go to the to the top of the mountain for people who understand and are committed to who they are and what they want to see in their in their roles and their opportunities. Um, and so also from an HR perspective, I know I won't have to take care of you because you're unhappy in your job because you didn't know what you wanted in the end anyways. So you are a much more attractive candidate to begin and move negotiations through when you pay attention to when you hone that inner game and that understanding. And that's my bit on negotiation. That's amazing. Thanks, Teresa. I am going to steal your breadcrumbs of joy and I will be using it this week in one or five conversations. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I did laugh out loud when you said spreadsheets were not your right comes to joy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my cousin is studying to be a CPA and uh, spreadsheets are her joy. Loves them. And I was like, you found it. Go. Yeah. I love working with people that love that. They're great <laughs> counterparts. <laughs> so good. <laughs> not my joy either. Um, does anyone have any burning questions right now? You can drop them in the chat raise your hand or Q&A. Otherwise, we'll move along and we'll just do Q&A closer to the end. No? Okay. So I will pass over to Eden next. Um, here, another great perspective. So Eden, please take it away. See if I can figure this out. <laughs> no guarantees. Okay. I think, I think we're there. Can you see this? Yes. That's okay, great. perfect. Thank you. And thank you, Teresa. That was so interesting. There's actually some parallels in what you were mentioning and even things that I think I, I noted for myself too in my own career. But um, thank you, uh, Kelly. I'm, I'm really excited to be here, um, especially with Carrie and Teresa who are so impressive on their own. Um, I'm going to be speaking from uh, a, a perspective of agency recruitment. Um, some people might not know what, what agency recruitment is, and so I'll give a bit of background on that. But uh, before we get started, just a little bit about me first. Um, so I was uh, a soccer player growing up. I was really competitive uh, playing with the Vancouver Whitecaps and, and Canada soccer. Um, I started playing for the national team when I was like 14 years old um, and had planned on doing that for the rest of my life. But unfortunately, I uh, had a back injury when I was 21 and uh, catapulted myself into the professional world that I wasn't prepared to enter. Uh, but that got me into, right off the bat, actually, roles that involved, involved hiring. Um, and so I've been doing that for the last 10 years and agency recruitment specifically for the last three and a half. Um, and currently I am the senior operations manager for a, a tech recruitment agency called ITIQ. So uh, to start us off, just a little bit about agency recruitment. Uh, for, for those of you that are familiar, you might have had uh, someone sliding into your DMs on LinkedIn uh, and messaging you, hey, I hope you're doing well, uh, which is the typical opening, and, and for others that aren't um, so aware. So just to give a bit of background, uh, we help organizations uh, filling jobs that their internal talent acquisition team are having uh, trouble filling or that they can't fill. And there's reasons why, you know, one is that they might not have um, the knowledge that they need or the networks already established uh, for something like tech recruitment, you know, maybe someone that went to school and they're studying for HR and then they become, you know, a TA and, and they're working on their internal HR team. Um, they might not understand what makes a great Java developer and what makes a mediocre one. And so um, that's where we can step in as an agency and just help because it is the bread and butter. It's, it's what we do every day is just working on tech specific roles. Um, and also what can happen too is, is with limited bandwidth. I mean, some companies, especially some startups that have come into Vancouver um, are going through this huge hyper growth stage. And you know the little team that they have uh, aren't able to fill these positions fast enough, you know, as they need to grow and they need to, to add people to their organization quickly. Um, and so, you know, recruiters that have established networks and already have people that they can, that they know are, are looking right now that they can call and, and make aware of a specific position uh, are a great help to organizations like that. So uh, when you work with an agency recruiter, uh, you do get access to a wide variety of organizations. It's kind of like a one-stop shop for a bunch of different companies and a bunch of different roles. Um, and how it works on our side is, you know, those organizations will pay the agency 
a placement fee or something like that if we find them a successful candidate. So it doesn't impact necessarily, it doesn't impact the salary that you're going to make. You don't have to think, you know, as a, as a candidate, what do I have to pay you for this service? You don't pay anything. The organization pays the agency for, for finding them someone that's suitable for their position. Okay. Um, now the benefits of working with a recruiter, I'm obviously very, very biased, um, but uh, working with a recruiter uh, is something that, you know, when I first got into agency recruitment, at the time I was managing a, a bar at a restaurant and um, I was actually uh, sitting there serving and upselling tequila to our CFO and not knowing who he was, but he opened my mind up to what agency recruitment could be. Um, so some people you know, like myself, have no idea what recruiters do. And once I, you know, got to understanding, I was like, why didn't I seek this out sooner? You know, at that time, I was trying to figure out what my next step in my career was going to be. And I didn't know who to call. Um, so here are some of the benefits of working with a recruiter. One is the market insight. Uh, recruiters spend eight to nine hours every day just talking to people like yourself in similar positions, uh, learning about the companies that they're working for, even understanding, you know, for us, like upcoming trends in technology and what everyone's talking about and the organizations they want to work for, some, you know, new technology that comes out that everyone wants to get experience with. So they have a lot of market insight, you know, for someone that's a developer that's, you know, head is down and they're coding all day, they might not have the time or the energy after uh, their workday to research and see what else is going on, or they might not have the network um, to reach out to to say, hey, you know, what are you doing? At at your company, you know, this is what we're doing here. So recruiters can provide that insight. Um, obviously, I'm speaking specifically from the tech world, but I'm sure it's the same, you know, with, with the other industries that you can work in. Um, the other thing is with client intel. When, when we represent or, or work with an organization, we know more ins and outs of that organization than a simple job description might tell you or that their HR or talent acquisition team might tell you because you know they're coming directly from that organization. Maybe they won't tell you the good and the bad, right? And and sometimes the job as a recruiter is, you know, we still want to sell that opportunity to someone, but at the same time, I think to be successful, setting the right expectations. And that means being honest. Listen, They've gone through a huge growth, but it's a little bit messy. It's a little bit chaotic right now. And they're trying to build some structure. So things like that, it's not necessarily talking someone out of a job, but you have this insight into the, the inner workings of that organization that can better prepare your candidates um, and better pre prepare you if you are going to interview there or if you, have, you have interest in working in that company. Um, so I think that's a, a huge benefit of working with recruiters, that additional insight. The other thing that recruiters can do is because we've you know, partnered with this team um, at the organization, we can sell your profile. We can give them a call and say, listen, I'm sending this application in. I think you've really got to meet Lisa. She's going to be perfect for this role. It's exactly like what you described you needed. Um, so just being able to have that direct contact. Sometimes I think, you know, and I've experienced this myself, just applying on my own. I felt like I was throwing my resume into like an infinite abyss and I would never hear back sometimes. And I didn't know where it landed, if they got it. Um, you know, sometimes you'd send an email and seek some feedback and never get it. So it just gives you an extra line of communication. Um, the free services that, that recruiters uh, provide is they'll help you, you know, resume, uh, format your resume. So uh, sometimes we don't have the time to add all the details or put it in a way that, that makes sense. And recruiters do that every day, um, prepping you for the interview. What I liked to do when I was recruiting was um, go through some practice questions with my candidate, just because sometimes it's just like about dusting off, um, you know, getting rid of those nerves, because maybe it's been a while since you've interviewed. So they can help you rehearse what your answers would be. Um, and then managing the negotiation side. Um, typically, it's, it's, it's you communicating through a recruiter um, with the client. And so that negotiation will be done by the recruiter on your behalf. And, and what's important in that, and, and we'll get to it, is that you have been open and honest with your recruiter so that they can best represent you and advocate for you for those conversations. All right. Not all recruiters are the same. Um, that's for sure. I think, you know, when I was recruiting the times that I'd call people and they'd be like, oh, I hate recruiters. I don't want to work with you. <laughs> um, you know, there is a, a big spectrum on, you know, the types of service that you'll receive. And that depends um, on the individual that you talk to. It depends on the agency and how they run their business. Um, but there are things that I think, you know, I would definitely expect when, when working with a recruiter. So 
the things that I think are most important is that the recruiter that you're speaking with is going to listen to your wants, to your needs. I think this goes back to, to what Teresa was mentioning, you know, the things that are your super strengths and, and that really excite you and, and make you want to get up in the morning and go to your job. That's the type of job that they should be seeking for you. Um, you know, the best recruiters are going to try to align with what you're motivated by, as opposed to trying to squeeze you into something that, you know, from the beginning didn't sound like it was the right role for you. Recruiters should be coaching you through the process. They should be open and honest about, you know, this opportunity and, and what they think maybe the salary bandwidth would be appropriate or, or how many candidates are interested. All that information, you know, is so helpful uh, for a candidate to make the decision on if they even want to present themselves to an opportunity or if maybe they better pass on this one. It, it isn't perfect for them. Um, but those, that communication that, you know, the, the touch points that you have with your recruiter, I think some of the, the nightmare stories that I've heard is like, yeah, they submitted my resume, then they never talked to me again, or I interviewed and then the recruiter never talked to me again. The, the touch points and, and the constant communication, I think, is an expectation you should have of your recruiter. And if you are working with one or if you seek one out in the future, um, I, would, I would probably steer clear of someone where you feel like it's just so hard to get a hold of them. You can't get the information that you need because, as you all know, career decisions are stressful enough as it is. Um, you want to make sure that you have the right people on your team when you're, when you're pursuing a new career path. All right. Now, how to best partner with a recruiter. Um, just my advice if you are speaking with someone or want to in the future, uh, things that made it really easy for me to, to help candidates that I've worked with in the past um, is to have a clear idea of what you want. And again, this goes back to what you were speaking about, Teresa, but sometimes a candidate just hasn't really thought about it enough. And, and you know, the first thing out of their mouth is like, well, I make this much today, so I need at least, at least this much money going forward. And that's fair. But as you all know, jobs are so much more than what you're paid. And and if it's draining you, that extra $10,000 a year, you know, when you dread getting up in the morning, it's just not worth it, right? And, and especially now, even with the, the impact of COVID, I think some people are reevaluating, you know, how they look at jobs. And I've seen people walk away from what good paying jobs because they wanted more flexibility and they wanted to be able to travel the world and work remotely, even if it means that they're going to make less money at the end of the day. So really thinking um, about what matters to you and, and some questions that I would use to ask candidates about this is, you know, if there's one thing that you could change about your current job, what would it be? Or, you know, what's a non-negotiable um, that you need to have when considering a new opportunity? Uh, one of my consultants had said, you know, that she wanted to be able to pick up her kids from school. As long as she had that flexibility, I could show her a job. But if, if it required her to be at her desk between, you know, nine and five, it wasn't going to work for her. And so little things like that can just help a recruiter eliminate some of the clutter and not send you jobs that are going to be a waste of your time. So, you know, maybe doing some soul searching, doing some of those exercises um, so that you know what's important to you. Um, it'll help the recruiter better service you and, and also make sure that you're, you're using your time um, and not having to, you know, read through all of these job descriptions that right off the bat, you know, that's not going to be a good fit for you. Um, on the other hand, honesty and transparency with your recruiter. There are so many times when candidates would say, I have nothing else on the go, no other opportunities. And so we would package together a submission with them and, and put them forward to a client. And as soon as the client's like, all right, you know, I'd love to schedule an interview. When can they come in? Candidates like, oh, I just got an offer. Sorry. But it literally is impossible in that time that that could have happened without this already being on the go. It's important to be honest with your recruiter about that. And, and there's a couple of reasons that, are, that would benefit you as the candidate in that situation. One is that they can advocate on your behalf and tell the client, listen, they just had two rounds of interviews. So I'd suggest you move quickly. Otherwise you're likely gonna miss out on this person. And I know they look really good for your job. So it can speed up the process when a recruiter can communicate how busy you are with other opportunities. Um, the other thing is, is every time your name is presented to a client, I like to think that like that is a first impression, right? So you want to be mindful of everyone's time that's involved um, because obviously it can harm your relationship with your recruiter or with that client if potentially you do want to apply to the, them again down the road. 
um, that this might, you know, put a bad taste in your mouth if you go through a couple of rounds and say you got nothing going on, but then in the, you have something in your back pocket or something like that. So um, allowing your recruiter to know that information just means that they can communicate that appropriately to the client. It doesn't mean that they're going to say, oh, you're seeking other roles. Well, we don't want to work with you, um, especially in this market. It, it just won't be the case. All right. Now, um, I just wanted to touch on a little bit about what's going on in the tech world. Um, I'm sure that you know the other panelists can speak about this as well. But just from what I'm seeing and and some of the research that I did, uh, just know that you know with these numbers, it seems like everything that I was looking at and that I have looked at have different numbers, but it's all kind of the same trend that we're seeing. So um, there's a lot of growth in Canada right now in technology. There's a lot of opportunity that's coming up. So in 2022 alone, that'll be just over 5%, but between 2021 and 2024, it'll be 22%. So there's a lot of opportunity for people that maybe have never considered working in technology before, or you know, even if they're as, as young as going to school right now and considering which, you know, what career path they wanna go in, technology is a great idea. Um, the other thing that, that speaks to that is that you know, over half, of these um, tech entrepreneurs and these um, tech companies are having trouble finding the talent that they need. So it is uh, what we call a candidate's market. There are tons of opportunities, but not enough people that are qualified to fill these jobs. And so what that does is there's a bit of a power shift, right? Now the candidates, the ones that have the skills, they have a lot of power in the conversation in, in hiring right now. Your negotiation, like you could ask for more than maybe you could have five years ago, right? Because there's a lot of companies that are going to be fighting for your attention and wanting you to choose them as the organization that you join. So when we say a candidate's market, that just means that, you know, each candidate right now will have multiple opportunities presented to them and they can pick and choose and, and organizations are going to go above and beyond to make sure that they're the selected one because otherwise they are again left without the person that they need to fill this job. And sometimes what that means is they're going to have to start lowering their bar, maybe for the, the quality of candidate that they bring forward or paying more, increasing their salary bands that they, they previously you know, would tell us, there's no way we'll go above this. Um, things that we heard a year ago, there's definitely been a shift in attitude with some of the clients that we work with. You know, faster hiring processes, that's something that's huge right now is you know, before some of our clients would take three or four steps before they would be able to make an offer, they wanted you to meet you know, enough people on the team and everyone to be able to vote and, and make sure that you're gonna be the right fit. Um, now they're going to consolidate. Maybe they'll have you meet, you know, three people in the first round and then three people. In, but trying to speed that up because timing sometimes um, is how they lose out on, on great people. Candidates, you know, that I've worked with will say, well, this company is my top choice, but I'll take the first offer that I get in my hands. And so when there's a bird in the hand, it's like, they got to take it, especially if they're on the bench and they're not currently employed, right? They want to make sure they don't lose an opportunity. So clients will move faster. When you're um, applying as candidates right now, I'd be prepared too that they're going to move quickly. So get in there when you're ready to make a move because there's going to be a lot of people like, trying to push you along in the process. And maybe you're like, I was just trying to dip my toe in here. Um, so just make sure that you're ready for that as well. Um, and the other thing is taking chances on potential. I'm seeing some clients, you know, with some of the opportunities that they had before they'd be really strict, you know, they have to have at least four years of experience with this or else we don't wanna see these people. Now it's maybe a little bit more flexible where it's like, okay, they can have two years, but they have to have a great attitude. So they're, they're investing in potential sometimes. If they can't find the quality and, and the expertise that they're looking for, sometimes they're a little more flexible on, on potential. So, you know, if you, if you are less experienced, um, there's, there's more opportunities now to, to get into great opportunities, great, great jobs, great, you know, well-paying jobs. Okay, and then finally, um, we have women and the technology sector. So um, again, the numbers can change slightly, but uh, from what I found in, and this research, this, uh, these statistics came from, I think, a North American study. So it's not just specific to Canada, but it's pretty well um, similar. So uh, women, you know, are 47% of uh, employees across all sectors, right? But in, in IT, um, you know, for computing related jobs, so more of the developer types of roles, 
they're only 26%. Women are only making up 26% of these roles. Um, the, the big tech companies, Facebook, uh, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they have uh, 34% women um, in their staff, so a little bit higher, um, but that might include some of the non-computing related jobs. So it goes without saying that there is a big discrepancy for the amount of women that are in these IT jobs. And it's known, right? It's, it's a common conversation in tech companies and in the news that it's you know a, a big discrepancy there. So there's a lot of pressure on companies to even this out. So it's a good time as a woman, if you're thinking about moving towards the tech sector, I think it's a great time to do that because there's a lot of visibility on this issue. Um, and there's you know direct efforts for people to join companies. Um, you know If you're qualified and you're a woman, it's just a win-win for a company because of course you're gonna be qualified for the role, but also you can help us even out this playing field here. So the reasons why women don't pursue careers in technology, I think there's a lot of them. Um, you know, some people, it's just because they don't know enough about it. They think, you know, I never really tinkered with computers growing up, so this isn't the, the industry for me. But there's so much more to, to tech. There's so many other um, avenues and, and um, departments within a tech company that you can work in. Um, you could have functional roles, like even on, on tech projects, you could be a project manager, a business analyst, a change manager, you could work in instructional design, anything like that, and, and there'd be an opportunity for you. You can work in customer experience or sales or learning and development, anything. Uh, but these tech companies, you know, they, they, need, they need to even this out because I think you have only one purview. It, it really limits your growth. It limits the, the different viewpoints that you can have. And I know um, even in my own company, um, I'm one of to uh, women in, in the management. Um, and they often say like, oh, I really like that you think about it this way. I didn't think about it this way. And it's just a different perspective. And I think that's, that goes with, you know, different backgrounds, different ethnicities and everything. Um, and, you know, on top of that, the good thing is there are groups to network, you know, with other women, maybe their support groups instead, but there are other groups that you can join and you can connect with like, like minded women and, and, Maybe your company has just a small group of them, but you could find other ways to connect with other women and, and get some support and, and share your experiences and so on. So to finish up here, I uh, just wanted to give a few tips. If you did want to find a recruiter, an agency recruiter, again, it's different from an internal recruiter because we work with a bunch of different organizations. Uh, the ways that you can do that, you can change your status on LinkedIn to open to work. Uh, that'll usually open up the gates pretty quickly and you'll have a bunch of people flooding in with messages. Obviously, there is some hesitation doing that because maybe your employer uh, is going to know. But if you are unemployed or you're looking for a change and maybe your manager knows, uh, you can change your status on LinkedIn. The other thing you can do is you can apply directly to recruitment agencies through their websites. Um, if you work in a specific sector, you could search that and agency recruitment or something like that so you can find the specific agencies that service uh, the industry you work in. You could post your resume to Indeed. It's another thing that a lot of recruiters go through and scour through resumes and see who's made themselves available um, to network with uh, on Indeed. And then finally, if you do find an agency that you think you know, specializes in your industry, you could send a message on LinkedIn to one of their recruiters. Um, one of the things that I would do if I were you is just have a look and see how long that recruiter's been there. If they've been there over a year, you're usually in, in good hands. Um, if they've only been there a few months, maybe you're gonna be working with someone who's a little bit more junior. Um, so just be you know, selective when you're sending messages out to, to recruiters. And that's it for me. Um, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, please feel free and send me a message if you have any questions. I'm happy to help any way I can. Uh, but that's it for me. Thanks so much. Thanks, Eden. That's so great. I know personally, I had really positive experiences working with recruiters when I was looking for work this summer. I was actually very like happy that they told me not to go after certain jobs because I was very clear with what I wanted and they're like no you're not going to get that culture there you're not going to get that you're not going to be happy because I right. knew absolutely what I wanted and they were happy to steer me away if needed <laughs> right awesome. which is what you want right you want it to be an honest conversation otherwise what's the point <laughs> exactly yeah, and uh, I love how creative people are starting to get with their compensation packages because it's so much more than pay. What makes you happy? For me, it's dogs. A dogs at home, dogs in the office. <laughs> and not having to be somewhere fighting rush hour traffic. <laughs> 
All right. Um, I think we'll move on and do Carrie next, and then we'll have um, Q and A at the end, just in case anyone needs to drop for time, and then we'll do Q and A after. So Carrie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted, so delighted to be here. And I just want to make sure you can see the right screen because uh, I have multiple screens up in front of me. Yeah, can I, I get a thumbs up? No, I think you have to change screen. Okay, thank you. Well, That's yeah. um, disappointing. <laughs> yeah, you know, there we go. All right. Perfect. That's backwards because I usually do it the other way. So, uh, yeah, okay, let me see if I can do this then. <laughs> well, thank you. It's so great to be here. I This is a conversation I got to say I could have all day long with these ladies, uh, with all of you that are here today. I'm so delighted that you all are here. Uh, so first, I'll just give you, a, I'll try and give you the thumbs, the tiny thumbnail of why I'm part of this panel. Um, but I want you to rest assured that when I started out my career, despite that I trained as a lawyer and I was a lawyer, you might think I knew how to negotiate from the womb. It's not true. I know because I trained lawyers and how to negotiate and I was at the UBC Law School and I was one teacher out of three and, you know, so maybe 12 people were getting trained in negotiation in my class every year, small number of people. Um, but by starting my career, I absolutely sucked at negotiation. Didn't occur to me to ask for more. I got caught later. I figured out with the other two women that were hired at the same time as me that we didn't negotiate, but the guy who was hired with us did. So we were about $8,000 behind him. Um, good news is we were able to negotiate it all back. Now there's a unique part of that story as to why that happened. Um, and later on, I was actually able to do, negotiate my first promotion at the same location, um, even though I wasn't qualified. I, did, I was missing one of the key criteria in terms of my length of call to the bar as a lawyer, but I put my hand up anyway, and I negotiated and navigated my way into that role. And one of the reasons why that worked for me very well was because of a thread that I think you might be hearing throughout what Eden and, <clears throat> excuse me, Teresa were sharing earlier, which is negotiation, especially when we're talking about job negotiation, whether it's for a new role or a promotion, it's taking in the place of a relate, in the context of a relationship. It's taking place in the context of a relationship. So this is all about the relationship that you have with your leader. If you're working with a recruiter, that's your first line of relationship building is with the recruiter who's going to go to bat for you. Um, and, and also you going to bat for yourself. Um, so I'm curious um, with the folks that are here. Oh, I just want to round out my little profile there. Um, I don't practice law anymore, but what I do, I learned I learned that what I was doing as a mediator, because I practiced as a mediator for a number of years too, was I was helping the parties to discover things about themselves and to have better conversations. And when I learned about coaching, I thought, wow, I can actually do that with one person and with a group of people. And that's where I found my super strength uh, that I really enjoy and love doing. Uh, so I'm an executive and leadership coach today. I work with many uh, leaders in navigating their career as well as uh, their leadership with their teams um, and their success that way. I also train negotiation in corporations and in co uh, companies large and small um, throughout North America and even I've even gone to New Zealand to do that so it's been quite a lot of fun. Anyway I digress this is about you not me um, so let me talk about negotiating a promotion so I'm going to bring you some do's and don'ts so for those of you who are uh, thinking about negotiating a promotion and actually I want to I want to actually check in with you if you can use the chat function if you can type me in the chat if you are looking to have a promotion within the next three months to 12 months so in in, in this current year are you looking for a nego uh, to negotiate a promotion and while you're while some of you are saying oh yeah that's me I'm gonna put my hand up so a few of you are typing me I want to share why you should be thinking about this because of what Eden just said about the, um, uh, the, the market out there right now. A lot of people are, a lot of companies are, are in a panic and leaders are in a panic because they're losing people. And so it's a candidate's market for new jobs. It's also a market for promotion. Why? It costs a lot more to bring on a new employee than it does to retain a current employee. So while you might be, you know, all the stars and the bells and whistles are going off, ah, it's time for me to look for a job outside. Think about whether if, if you're, if this is a company you want to grow with, look around and think, how can I grow faster, smarter? How can I grow more? Where is it that I want to grow right now? And pick up on what Eden started with, started with and 
Teresa as well, is getting super clear on what your strengths are and what, what's important to you and where you want to go. When you have that clarity, that's your first line of strength in a negotiation uh, so that you're navigating this whole, this whole relationship. So let's, whoops, I, I went too, I touched my mouse and it went forward and I wasn't ready to go yet. So give me one second here. I need to go back. Where's my back button? <laughs> okay, I've got to go down here. Give me one second. My screens are backwards, so I feel a little backwards myself. So one of the things I wanted to share too is, um, both in US and Canada, the reports for 2022 are that the average pay increases without doing anything are around 2.7%, 3%. So without doing anything, many companies are looking to do that and some aren't doing anything at all. The average um, increase when you leave and go to another job prior to our great reshuffle situation that we're in right now, the average increases tend to be around 10 to 20%. So when you make a leap, you can look to you know, navigate that for a 10 to 20% increase. Now, you know, it's kind of a wild card as Eden was talking about. So I've seen some people negotiate in that kind of a leap, uh, lots of like much higher percentages. But here's the thing, I've also seen, even before COVID, I've worked with some of my clients um, I'll give you two stories. One, uh, a woman who um, she was navigating a promotion within her organization and she negotiated a promotion from a national leader to a global director with over a hundred thousand dollar pay increase. So that was just on the salary, leave everything else alone for the moment. Um, and another client who went from VP to SVP uh, this was actually during COVID and more than doubled her salary. So I want you to know that this is possible as a promotion, not having to leave and go somewhere else. Okay, so I want you to, to see that there's some possibilities here that you might not otherwise be thinking about. So let me talk about um, let me talk about some of the do's and don'ts. I'm going to start. I know Teresa was talking about the mindset. We don't want to stay in a negative mindset for long, but I do want to share a couple of don'ts. Um, and the first of these is to be thinking about, let's see if I can make it go forward now by clicking. There we go. So these are some of the three things that you don't want to be doing. The first one is don't wait for them to notice how hard you're working. <laughs> So I want to see if you can say me in the chat again, if this is you, you put your head down and you work really hard. Yeah, Jay Mankevska, I apologize if I'm not saying that appropriately. Um, yeah, she's got a little, or he's got a, a smiley face there. Um, when we put our heads down and wait for them to notice how hard we're going to work, they think they're going to, yeah, thank you, uh, pay you what you're worth, or they're going to tap you on the shoulder for promotion. You could be waiting a long time. Why? Well, Eden talked about this, about recruiters are busy, right? Well, if you think recruiters might be busy, what about your leaders? Most leaders in today's world are too busy to actually track your successes, to know exactly what you've been doing every moment of every time of every day. And in fact, most of us don't want that kind of micromanagement. So it's your job to help them see that, to keep them up to date on what it is that you're doing, what your accomplishments are. You also don't want to be waiting for the performance review time or worse, wait for the budget time for to ask for that promotion or a salary raise. Why? Because if you wait again, if you wait for them, it's on their timeline and also because some decisions might already be made that you have lost an opportunity to influence. So instead, you want to be thinking about how you can put your value out there and showcase to your manager, to your other leaders, the things that you are doing and put your value on the table as early as you can. So when the group of us were talking earlier and getting ready for this, I said, you know, I really think that the, the negotiating for a promotion starts the day you start your job with that employer. So don't wait. Start right away and make sure that you're getting regular meetings with your manager um, and that you're able to have those types of conversations. Now I've just had a tech snafu where these two screens have gone dark and I've got one screen down here so I'm going to see if I can keep maybe making things move forward but I can't see any of you right now <laughs> so if, uh, if I'm being flagged for anything uh, Kelly would you please just pop in and let me know if I need to pay attention to anything. Thank you. Um, now have I gone to do this yet? Have I done the don't? I haven't finished the don't yet. Okay um, and don't approach your boss when they're under pressure. 
that, that should be a no-brainer, but we want to make sure that we're approaching your boss when they have the bandwidth to have the conversation. Don't take them by surprise. Instead, you want to actually lay the groundwork and actually, you know, make a time to have the conversation about your compensation. And maybe you're doing it regularly by saying, you know, here's where um, I want to grow in my career. What do you see as the possibilities ahead for me? Or what do you see as a, a possible roadmap that I might be able to follow? Or what do you see as the things I should be paying attention to? When you're having those kinds of conversations with your leader on an ongoing basis, you're positioning yourself for that promotion even before it's there in front of you. Um, so you might be, you know, this might be taking place over a three to six month or even a 12 month period, but you're laying the groundwork and it's almost like you're planting seeds along the way. So I've given you a few don'ts. Now I want to make sure I give you a few do's. So I've got five do's on our list. And those are the first of one here. Let's see if my clicker goes ahead. Is you want to be putting your hand up. Right? You want to be putting your hand up and saying, hey, I'm interested. And if a promotion, if something is, is put out there as a possibility or they're starting to talk about, oh, we're looking to hire for this position or that position, and you're saying to yourself, wow, that sounds like a really good place for me to go, don't wait until they've posted the position. And in many cases, positions aren't posted anyway. Uh, so a lot of, a lot, the vast majority of jobs are actually filled through private networks and not through public posting. So if you're going to the Indeed sites and the Monster sites, or you're going to the recruiter sites and you're waiting until employers put their, their postings out there, or you're looking internally for those types of opportunities, don't wait again for them to put it out there public. Ha be having the conversations and positioning yourself. So, and when something does come out there, make sure that you're putting your hand up and not waiting until you have 80 to 100% of the qualifications. Remember my story, I had a glaring qualification that I did not have and I still put my hand up and I still got the job in part because I was already there, it was an internal promotion and I was well known and I had good relationships with uh, my current boss and the boss that I wanted to work for. So be considering that. Now your second do, I know I'm speeding through this pretty quickly, but we have limited time together today and please feel free to follow up afterwards if you've got any questions that we can't answer today. My second one here, my second tip to do is build what I call your bank vault of value. And I think Eden, you touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, as did Teresa. And I call this a bank vault because it's so valuable. This is your, this is your currency that you have to share uh, with your organization. And you can have this whether you're going for promotion internally or you're looking for another ro uh, role down the road. But keep track of it. I was actually at the W North concert conference last week, not concert, and one of the speakers there shared what I thought was a great idea is you can actually take out your phone and you can track some of this bank vault of value with your phone. Anytime you get any kind of accolades for work, maybe it's an email or maybe somebody sends you a card. First of all, keep those hard copies and put them in a file somewhere, but also snap a picture with your phone. And before you do that, create a folder in your photos that maybe you wanna call it my bank vault of value and you store copies of them in there. So it serves a couple of purposes. One, you're tracking and keeping ready for yourself all those things, those accomplishments that you're doing. Anytime you do, you, you, you've completed a project and you've gotten a great result, especially one that has a numeric number to it, like maybe you've saved X number of dollars or you've made X number of dollars or you've hired X number of people or you've met the, the deadline well within timelines, keep track of those things um, in, in that folder. Um, so that becomes something you can reference when you're in your conversation with your leader about why they should promote you. It's also a great place to go when you're having one of those crappy days when you feel like, ugh, it's just, I just don't know if I know what I'm doing. Maybe you're suffering a little imposter syndrome, or maybe you've actually, maybe you've gotten some bad feedback and you just want to remind yourself that, hey, you know what? You're doing pretty awesome. Go check out your bank vault of value and I guarantee it's going to make you feel better uh, too. Um, the third one is you want to connect the dots for your leader. So you have your bank vault of value. You're doing your research. Now, Eden talked about recruiters are great because they, they've got a lot of that market value or market research um, in hand because they're a big organization as opposed to you one person. And so you might be doing your, some of your research that way. You can certainly do a lot of research on your own to figure out how do I compare with what's going on in the marketplace. 
Um, you know, one of my clients discovered that for her role, she was vastly underpaid um, with similar um, or uh, similar companies here in Vancouver as well. And so we worked together for her to be able to go to her manager at a very different uh, personality style that she was rather intimidated about, but she knew she really wanted to go after that that promotion and that pay raise um, that was going to be comparable to what she was actually doing. Uh, but she had done that research on her own. So look for how you can figure those types of things out so that you can help connect the dots for your leader. And also connecting the dots in terms of what's important to your company, to your organization. Look to the mission, vision, and values of that company. The, the, what's, the, what's the plan for this coming year? When you understand what the corporate direction is, you can help your leader see, well, you know, I know we're going in this direction, and here's where I see that I can add value in this next role. And I really want to be able to bring that and bring that kind of success into that next role. Uh, would you be willing to help me do that? Or would, do you, would you be able to support me in uh, moving forward into that particular role? So helping them connect the dots. And related to that is also thinking about recruiting allies for your moving forward. So whether you're working with a mentor internally or better, even better, or as good as, and, and uh, have one as well, is if you have a sponsor internally, somebody who's willing to go to bat for you is to champion your career growth within the organization. Um, peers can also be allies in terms of helping you understand the lay of the land and also the most important ally can also be your boss, especially if they're not the one who's the decision maker. So recruit your boss and help help give them what they need to go to their boss to say, hey, you know, I think Eden's really the prime one for this next job. I want to put her forward uh, to you as the next candidate for this next role. Here's why I think she's great. So help your boss say yes to you and help your boss be able to get the yes for you, especially if they're not the decision maker. So recruit allies. And then lastly, it's the old adage, if you want to get to Carnegie Hall, this is years ago, you say that you got to practice, practice, practice. And so you want to rehearse. Now here's the value of rehearsing. And by rehearsing, I mean, don't just read what the things are that you want to say. You want to maybe script out a few key phrases. Maybe you've heard a few here tonight and, and kind of get an idea of, of the trickier moments in your negotiation that you want to be able to say, especially when it comes to asking for money. Most of us have a little bugaboo when it comes to asking for money for something. And the money can be thought of as salary. So I encourage you to think about your whole compensation, not just the salary. The salary seems to represent the money. It's very important in terms of what it represents um, in terms of your status in the organization and how promotable you are. So don't leave salary alone, but think about the bigger picture around compensation. Somebody mentioned earlier about there's amazing, I think Kelly, it was you, there's amazing things that people are including in their negotiations. So be creative. Use that open mindset to think beyond the money and the monetary. Think beyond bonuses. Think beyond vacation time. Think about the things that you need in order to be successful in that new role. Maybe it's title. Maybe it's an assistant. Maybe it's time off to go and get your MBA in a, while you're in this role. Whatever those things are. Be creative. Um, and practice out loud in front of a mirror. Maybe you work with a coach. Uh, maybe you work with a peer. Practicing out loud, even if it's in front of the mirror, is a good way to feel it coming out of your mouth because that's, it sounds funny, but until you've heard your, until your body, your mouth has, has formed the words, it can feel like you're choking, right? And we don't want that. We want you to be able to come off sounding confident. And if you're not feeling confident, you can even just say that, you know, I know this is a tricky time. They might be feeling uncomfortable too. If you acknowledge that and say, this is really important to me. This is what I'd like to discuss. I'm a little bit nervous. That's okay, you know? And here's, here's what I really want to talk about today. So those are, those are my, my, my five do's. Um, I hope we've uh, covered everything there. And again, I can't see anybody, so I'm just going to throw up this last slide. All these links on here are clickable, so if you want to go and join me on LinkedIn, you should be able to just click right on the screen. And if not, just look up my name and you will uh, find me, Carrie Gallant. And I'm going to stop now and stop sharing my screen and see if I can see y'all <laughs> uh, and find out what our questions might be today. I also threw into the, the chat uh, just a link to everyone's link. Did Thank you. Hey, uh, have a question. 
what are some good research sites for a specific position uh, to refer to to ensure you have comparable information to help with the negotiation? So anyone can take that. So basically, where should we go to see what we should be making? I know some people have looked at Glassdoor because sometimes they'll have posted salaries on there. You have to take it with a grain of salt though, because mm -hmm. sometimes I've looked and I'm like, well, that's not even right. But so I think some people do use that as a tool where people will post their salaries, but you just have to be careful trusting it fully. Pay scale, um, angel list, depending. Um, it's really also just having lots of interviews and talking to lots of companies and finding out how much they're, they're offering. That's, it's, a, it's a numbers game, pun intended. <laughs> I think Indeed is another another website to try. Um, a lot of them are, are American focused, so you want to make sure you're looking at the Canadian site um, and and looking for that. And I would echo the other the other suggestions. Yeah, we also have a comment. If it's a public organization, mm -hmm. um, ask HR. They have to tell you. Right. Yeah. And uh, if I can speak to that, because I've worked in a, a few public institutions, is um, no, uh, also when you, if you do go to talk to HR, and I know we had a CPHR on the call earlier, I don't know if she's still with us, she might be able to e echo in here as well. Um, but in the public sector, um, sometimes the hiring range is not the whole range. There's another range behind that. Um, and so you know, te you can test the assumption that even if there's a hiring range of, say, I don't know, 100 to 120, that may not be all that's available if you can show that you are worth more to them than the 120. So just be careful of making assumptions that when you get that public range, that that's all that's there. So true. When you get asked the dreaded, what is your salary expectations question, uh, what would be the best response? Oh, the, the ladies know I've been thinking about this one. Um, <laughs> we've been talking about this. Uh, there's this, there's an art to something called the answering questions with questions, but but in a very collaborative way. So if you were to say, the recruiter says, so what money do you want to make? Um, you want to come back with, um, uh, well, I've, I've, uh, I've, like an example could be, I've heard roles like this are 130,000, 140,000 per year, does that sound like it's on target for you? Um, and, the, and the recruiter might say, oh, that's a bit high for us. And then you come back with another question. Okay, so do you have a range for this role? And they might come back with, uh, well, 100, you know, we're looking 120, 130. And you're like, okay, that's great. And then I know that Caitlin, uh, rather Carrie and I were talking about this, that you need to be careful what number you suggest because the number you suggest becomes what's called an anchor. And so you notice I said 130 to 140. Well, I know my number I want is 130, but I'm listing it as the lowest mm -hmm. so that I have a better chance of getting it. So there's all sorts of psychology and subjective nature, subjective nature to it, but um, you're trying to get the most information out of them, but make sure you do it in a collaborative, warm way. Granted, like, you know, and I, and I know Eden mentioned this before too, um, there's a lot of crappy recruiters out there that will make it a very pleasurable process for you. And, and I'm so sorry if that's ever happened to you. I've had it too. Um, but I work as an in-house recruiter and, and Eden is in the agency recruitment land. There are good recruiters out there that will actually collaborate with you and, and show transparency and visibility to the process. So don't give up. And, and if they're crappy, maybe it's an indicator of the company. Yeah. Very, very true. And then on the flip side, if you're looking for an internal promotion, how would you suggest to start that conversation of, I feel like I need at least 10% more based on X and X contribution? So that comes back, uh, Kelly, to what's happened before that. So when we go to our boss and say, and this goes, I think, Teresa, you were talking about um, language. Um, if we go in and we say, um, listen, I've been here, I've been here three years now, um, and I haven't had a raise, uh, I, I, I deserve at least a 10% increase. 
That's a, yeah, these, Teresa's already shaking her head. <laughs> That's already coming from a place of, of uh, scarcity and need um, versus what you're going to be sharing in, in terms of value. So let, let, let's, let's be clear here. When we're in an employment relationship and the money is exchanging hands, notice I said the word exchange, the money that they're paying you is an exchange for the value that you bring to the organization. And most of the times we can look at a position and say in the, in the for-profit world, so outside of the public sector, one of the um, general rules is that that position should produce at least one and a half times its value, if not two and a half. So the more that you're able to create as value in exchange for the compensation that you're receiving, they're getting a great deal. But if they're only getting back what they're paying you, that's not a good deal for them. So I'm challenging the approach, Kelly, more than I'm challenging the number. Um, and so what you wanna be clear on is having a strong why this is useful for the employer. Now, sometimes the, the, the key that's, that's useful for them is like my client that I mentioned earlier, she was being paid less than the market rate. Um, her boss wasn't really even aware that the company had fallen behind, so they were no longer competitive, right? So by falling behind, now the company as a whole has a problem. It's not just her pay. Um, it's the company as a whole. Um, and so she was able to negotiate with him uh, at something, I think it was around a 25% increase, even though at first he only offered her 7%. Because she practiced, she held her ground and went back in again and, and asked for more. It doesn't quite get to your question, Kelly, but it's we want to be want to be unpacking more than just saying, I want to go in and ask for a $10,000 raise. It's why is that important to them? Why is it important to you? Um, and to, to lay the groundwork for, for that. Um, what what's in it for them? Value. I'm a big uh, cheerleader of monetizing everything, like your value and what you bring. Yeah. Uh, I tell people think like a CEO. Like there needs to be an ROI right. for what you're doing. It's not about oh manage me, make my career good. You know, it's not it's not about being serviced like they're so lucky to have you. You're coming there to offer. Uh, an ROI on your on your activities. And so I think, you know, what Carrie, you're talking about, like there is so much prep. Get your prep dialed. Spend a lot of time on your prep and then a really small amount in a meeting. Yeah, I, I say that it's 80% preparation, 20% execution, maybe 10% execution. Yeah. yeah. And you can't execute if you haven't prepared. Mm -hmm. And if you, and to Carrie, you made a really good point. Like if you're under market, um, one way, like I, I have a privilege being in house as a recruiter that I'll see people who are under market and I can actually help certain situations mm -hmm. with employees internally, but for yourself, if you know, you're under market, um, again, the exec, the language of executives is data. So collect your data on as many reputable sources as possible yeah. around who's making what and how much in what industries and markets. And then you present that in a spreadsheet and, and facts like much better than like, yeah. Have a raise, right? And Teresa, if I can just pick up on that for a second, because I think one of the things we want to be careful of, especially for women, is when we're talking about value, we're not talking about self worth. Although it is related, but we want to be clear that when we're talking about, you know, oh, I don't feel like I'm that valuable. Well, get the data, let the data prove to you what you're worth so that you can go and ask for that. Um, and, and, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're struggling with it, ask for help, you know, uh, look outside and, and, and find somebody who can help you discern what it is you bring to a role. You know, we can do, we don't have to wait until we're leading a team or leading an organization to ask for a 360. We can actually go to our peers and our, and our, our loved ones and say, what do you see that I'm great at? What do you think I'm really good at? Or what might even be missing thinking that I might not think I'm good at, but I'm, it's actually so natural to me that I don't even see it. You know, so we ask for help for that. Yeah, that's great. I um, have a few questions. So first one, given the inflation in Canada recently, are companies taking this seriously into account on promotions and hires? So I think maybe start with uh, Teresa Eden on the recruiter side. Sorry, I, I didn't hear the end of that oh, question. Yeah. Do you mind repeating it? Yeah, it just, uh, given the inflation, right? Mm -hmm. That's happening everywhere. Are companies seriously taking that into account 
on promotions and new hires for salary? Ah, uh, yeah, I think so. I don't. I, they don't have a choice. <laughs> Otherwise, you you're gonna lose. So I think initially they were like, no, this is gonna pass. This isn't true. But I think they miss out on hiring great people time and time again, and they have no choice. So especially for the new hires, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And if they're not, maybe time to start looking. <laughs> well, if I might add too, I mean, Eden's right. Uh, I do see that a lot where, you know, uh, CEOs, uh, organizations are a little freaked out about it and trying to manage this whole great reshuffle with, with the loss of so many people who have left. Don't let that stop you from, from negotiating for something that you want. You might get no, and no, it doesn't mean never. It means no right not this second. So then ask some follow-up questions. What would it take to get there? What do I need to, what do we need, what do we more importantly need to do in order to get me to that next level? When you're in a promotion conversation, if it's a new job and you're negotiating for a new job, it's like, well, what can we do to bridge the gap? Because maybe, maybe it's not just salary, that is available. Maybe there's other things as we talked about earlier to get creative. So don't let it stop you. And yes, companies are looking at it because they know they're in, they're caught between this rock and a hard place. They need to fill the positions and there's all this inflation. And there's lots of places where they can get that money. <laughs> Not just from you. Yeah, very, very true. Um, another question, how would you calculate an ROI for a job? Oh, well, unless you ladies have something you want to jump in, but ROI for yourself, um, ideally you have a, a job description for your role. Some of you might not. Um, and that's a great time to create one yourself and present it to your manager and get their notes mm -hmm. um, to have something a little bit more concrete around your role and responsibilities. So, you know, in order to understand where you need to go, you understand where you are. Um, and so, making making an understanding of those and then you can even have some really wonderful conversations um leading up to a formal conversation around ne negotiating a, a raise and so forth where you're getting key indicators around what excellent performance could look like be like hey i know i'm you know this is a big piece of my job and i'm doing x like you know if you were to like look at that and say like how how is how am i doing am i like good or like even better if will be even better and so then you're you're getting the ammunition to understand and 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 like and if you really want because this is my hr background company, if you really want to be um sleuthy about it after your meeting with your manager when you have some understandings around exceptional performance and what that would be after your meeting you send a friendly email be like thank you so much for the time you spent with me this is called documentation thank you so much for the time you spent with me it was really exciting to you know to understand your perspective around what good looks like some examples you shared were such things like such as this um, I'm really grateful. I'm looking forward to putting that into action. If anything's unclear with what I'm understanding from our conversation as I'm reflecting in this email, um, just let me know. Don't make it long. Don't be too worried because especially if you're reporting to executives, they don't have any time, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm a fan of the documentation process. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And I love that you did that one, Teresa, because I'm a huge fan of that too, yeah. um, that we want to be documenting those conversations. It doesn't have to be a 10, 20 page contract. It just has to be what your understanding is of the conversation, because you can go back to that later if there was ever, if there's ever any misunderstanding about what's what. You can say, oh, but remember that email I sent you? I can, I can show it to you where uh, you agreed that we said that we were going to do X, Y, and Z, because they forget too. They're human. Um, and the other part about the ROI is try to quantify your results that you've been able to do as much as possible. Even if you're not in a revenue producing role, you could look at the cost savings. You could look at um, how many weeks of time. I mean, organizations want to save time doing things too. If you've had any, anything to do with uh, cutting off the time it took to do something, quantify that it, you know I was able to through my work is this, in this project we were able to get it in under under budget on time or three weeks early or I discovered a great new way uh, for us to do a new a system that allows us to do x y and z whatever it is that you can put down on paper again even if you can't quantify it in dollars or or time just document it as, as clearly and as succinctly as you can and ask for that kind of level of specificity in feedback, whether it's a formal performance review or not, uh, from your boss as well. 
That's massive. Like if there's one thing everyone takes from this mm -hmm. night is is what Carrie is talking about because now you can write a resume. Yes. That things That's like CEO. Cool. And things like, what's my ROI? Because right. every time I, when I'm, I'm looking at thousands of resumes and my eyes are crossing, it's like, tell me how you made a difference to the organization. Yeah. Don't just tell me what you did. Tell me how you made a difference. So okay. that bank vault thing that you mentioned, or, you know, breadcrumbs of joy when you're feeling miserable to help you understand that you're, you're keeping track and you're using data for you. Yes. Cause I'm, I can guarantee you're going to use data in your job for your organization, especially going forward in the future. But number one, this is super, super important. I'm so glad you and, brought that up. And all of this too, that we've all talked about tonight, when you do this, it positions you as a leader. And we are here in the Women in Leadership Foundation, right? So even if you don't have a formal leadership title right now, be the leader of your career. And as you're acting in all these, negotiation is a leadership skill. It really is. I don't know anybody who's successfully made it into a leadership position or a leadership role who hasn't on some level had to negotiate a lot and had some level of mastery. So practice where you can. Yes, I love that. And yeah, if you can't get the numbers, you know, ask your boss for them. Hey, who customers do I talk to in the day? Hey, that project we just finished. I feel like we made it twenty five percent more efficient. How many people work in that department again? <laughs> yeah, like go out and chase down the facts, right? Yeah. Impact right? conversation. Impact on the org. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? We can have to the end of time here. No. Okay. In the interest of time, we'll probably leave it there. Um, unless anyone has any final thoughts or final. Hmm. No. Good. Oh, maybe one final question. Just, just a thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks again. Amazing conversations. I'm so thrilled everyone took time out of their day. Um, applause to everyone attended that just took time out for yourself and to grow and to learn. And um, hopefully, you know, you can share some success stories with some amazing panel. Send them a note on LinkedIn. Your yeah, advice yeah. got me this new job, right? Got me this way. Um, always amazing to share. Yeah, well, have a great night, everyone. And thanks for our, our, the other great yeah. panelists and Maureen for inviting us and Kelly, you for shepherding us tonight. Thank you so much. Yes, my pleasure. Hope to see everyone virtually in another event soon. Bye, Take everybody. Care. Bye, everyone. Thank you.